In this book, postcards narrating the Great Kanto disaster, there are dozens of photographs and postcards from just after the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake. Newspapers often describe the damage as unprecedented in the aftermath, and it was. More than 100,000 people perished over a 48-hour period, mostly in Tokyo. The low city side of Tokyo saw the worst loss of life. That much of Tokyo was still built from Edo-era wooden homes, and that many homes had a flame burning to cook lunch when the quake struck, only magnified the disaster's potential. Many of the most disempowered people of Tokyo suffered the worst. The sex workers and entertainers at Yoshiwara were trapped by the neighborhood's large gates, left to burn or drown. Many of Tokyo's poorest residents, largely living in Fukugawa or Honjo wards, suffered the most, and vicious and false rumors made ethnic Koreans and Chinese the target of vigilante attacks. Somewhere from 6,000 to 20,000 were murdered in the chaos. After such devastation then, it's some wonder that this book contains so many gruesome photos and postcards of the dead. Now I don't think these postcards were floating through the mail like less shocking ones, but it's worth asking. What can we learn about the industry of these photos and postcards, and who produced them? These photos and postcards often lacked any visual or descriptive context beyond the grisly details of a dead body. That made them quite liable to become commodified. They also crystallized the somewhat contradictory but coexisting identities of Japanese citizen as both consumer and imperial subject in 1923. In other words, the two identities sometimes clashed or flexed, but immediately after this disaster, that consumer impulse really seemed to eclipse the imperial citizen, especially with state power visibly and literally wiped from the capital. Now to be clear here, I'm drawing on a lot of historiography that I'm leaving out. Scholars of the disaster, interwar Japan, and beyond. But mostly I'm working from Jennifer Weisenfeld, J. Charles Schenking, and Alex Bates' work on the disaster, and Miriam Silverberg's erotic grotesque nonsense to put my ideas together. You can see the video description for a full list of works consulted. But let's look at some interesting stuff. On October 19th, 1923, 49 days after the quake, 200,000 people gathered along the Sumida River at the Honjo Clothing Depot and a large residence of the Asuda family to mourn the dead. Each were sites of tremendous loss in the disaster. 30,000 people died at the Honjo Clothing Depot alone, leaving mounds of bones like these. At these memorials, the chairman of the Tokyo Prefectural Assembly and Diet members spoke of sacrifice. Yet at the same time, despite an imperial edict barring such images, small-time sellers were hawking postcards of the dead on the streets. The Kokumin Shimbun published an article on October 21, just two days after that memorial, titled, 8,000 Banned Pictures, Large Illicit Trade by Cipher Telegram. The military police, still active in Tokyo, ended up confiscating more than 8,000 photos of dead bodies, particularly those showing the 30,000 dead at Honjo Warehouse and the entertainers at Yoshiwara. But that was no anomaly. Besides relaying the calamity, publishers were quick to turn a profit. Numerous advertisements from the Osaka Asahi Shimbun and the Tokyo Asahi Shimbun, as soon as it could begin printing again, advertised postcards and pictorial magazines of the disaster. Take for example a September 11 advertisement saying that every retail marketplace in Osaka was selling postcards at rates of 8 postcards for 30 sen. Photos went at a price of 6 for 1 yen. Of course, it's not clear what sort of postcards those were, but so soon after the disaster, it was an industry. Many of the photos from the disaster were taken as if someone were just walking by, and camera shops seemed to have caught on. The Kawada camera shop ran an ad on September 13 in the Osaka Asahi Shimbun for a variety of their cameras. There are many differences between this ad and previous ones from the Kawada camera shop, but the most interesting part is that they were using the disaster to advertise. When going to the disaster area, a camera is a must-have. Without lies in a photo, more quickly, with reliability, influentially, and concretely, what reported the truth before all else is the camera. Going to the disaster zone becomes more significant. Moreover, the camera is the thing that can eloquently report the facts. We submit, to the left side of the page, the most appropriate items for those with these and other goals imported for the same cost price. But what about the actual photos of the dead? Not just camera sellers and general disaster media. The Osaka Mainichi Shimbun published a photo of dead bodies on September 7, which they were later censured for. And don't forget those 8,000 confiscated postcards from before. Or, according to a November 21 article from the Asahi Graph, one man was hawking postcards between Azuma Bridge and Shirahige. He had photos of a massive crack in front of the Imperial Palace and dead bodies stacked at Yoshiwara. On December 26, the Tokyo Asahi Shimbun reported that, according to the prosecutor's office, more than 500 people had violated the publishing law, and most of them because they had published pictures and postcards of dead bodies. One arrested person had sold photographs from 50 sen to 1 yen, and had sold somewhere from 5,000 to 10,000 by the time they were arrested. 
Even the Western-owned English-language Japan Chronicle Weekly caught on to this trend. They wrote that someone was trying to peddle postcards of Yoshiwara and Honjo to passengers boarding a Trans-Pacific steamship. Yet, at the same time, the government was trying to use the disaster as something to produce loyal and moral citizens. The Ministry of Education published a three-volume series simply titled Education Materials Regarding the Disaster that contained dozens of heroic stories like a student casting his notebook away to save another person, and teachers rescuing the portraits of the Taisho Emperor. Finally, if we take a close look at the content of these photos, if you can stand to stare at them, we realize that they're very liable to be commodified. Compared to that earlier photo in the Osaka Mainichi Shimbun from September 7, with the building a part of the photograph, a lot of them are just gruesome close-up shots. In other words, they lack context. They're just dead bodies, divorced from that disaster, conceived of as a national tragedy. Like decaying terracotta figures, mutilated, burned, and drowned. One might imagine someone walking around the city just to collect photos of these dead. And actually, something like that did happen. One primary school student recounted that his uncle traveled from Bunkyo Ward on the wealthier side of town to the low city side of town where the density of death was much higher. And this after seeing photos of dead bodies. Ultimately, these postcards and photos, at first surprising and shocking in their existence at all, were part of a larger frenzy of media consumption at the time. Sometimes they probably functioned as dead bodies for someone's personal viewing pleasure, even reinforcing calcified social statuses, just as Jennifer Weisenfeld relates how the young women at Yoshiwara, once longingly gawked at while alive, were now gawked at in curious horror and death. But there's a kind of duality that these photos and postcards unveil. The state did not want those images floating around. And yet citizens continued to sell them at great risk and profit. 